Happy Monday. Yeah, Monday. I've been enjoying podcasting every week with you. <laughs> <laughs> that makes one of us. <laughs> this has been good. It's actually been fun to, to dive into some deeper stuff because when you go on a weekly basis, it's kind of like, okay, you know, we're yeah. going this week. I also like that um, when you work on something during the week, yeah. you can just bank it and be like, oh, this is a great pod topic, yep. which is, yeah. We've just, had some of that. Yep. For sure. Um, cool. So the last few weeks, we've been talking about uh, static site generation and request response web applications, uh, of which buildui.com is now one. And we were talking about caching last week and the next cache announcements. And this week we thought it'd be fun uh, to talk about server components um, because uh, they're kind of being talked about right now a lot on Twitter. In particular, Dan Abramov had a nice thread where he basically said, ask me anything. And there was a bunch of stuff just kind of that was out there um, that kind of spurred a lot of conversation. So we thought it'd be fun to read through some choice uh choice morsels from this from this thread and uh i think also to just talk about um we kind of wanted to bring it back to like the server versus client stuff and uh, i had written down something about you know the interaction patterns with server versus client apps and now i'm trying to remember where that came from what spurned that um probably the remix stuff you've been working on yeah exactly Right. It was because I've been working on the remix course uh, for Build UI and we're kind of following the docs philosophy in terms of um, it's not even just a docs philosophy. It's the remix way of building an app where you kind of use HTML forms as the structure and the skeleton and then you kind of add these things. But um, there was some Twitter conversations I got into and just some um, thought battling over kind of the philosophy, I guess. So, um, cool. Yeah. So it would be fun to talk about some of that. Um, let's actually start with that Yeah, because I think it sets the stage well for why it can feel like sometimes the front end community is like always trying to work on new paradigms, inventing new paradigms. And then you hear people say like, oh, look, JavaScript is rediscovering how PHP works or how we did websites 10 years ago. Whereas obviously that's like a that's like a superficial take that doesn't acknowledge like the actual things that have gotten better uh, while also being capturing a kernel of truth, which is that there was a lot of stuff given up with the attempts to make things better in like the last, I guess, five to 10 years of work in the front end. So anyways, um, kind of all that ceremony aside, let's start with just the remix stuff. And uh, I was working on, you know, the first app that we're building. It's like the course is called my first remix app. And it's like, the way you would teach a Rails app would be like, let's look at the guides. Rails is a great example of a framework that is opinionated enough that, you know, 10 different beginners should be able to go there, make an app for the first time, and it should basically look the same. Um, which is not something you can say about every framework, especially like more of a library, like a, just a React that's not wired up with the framework because, you know, it's not as opinionated and there's more decisions to make. Rails takes like a stance of pride in like making sure it's like this opinionated framework and Remix is a lot closer to that, especially closer than a lot of other tools in the JavaScript ecosystem. And um, if you were to build kind of like this work journal app that we're building, it should look very, very similar, you know, if 10 people were to build it for the first time. So I was, you know, in preparation for the second lesson in the course, which is about the first form. Um, I was reading a, a lot of the documentation because I wanted to absorb how, you know, Ryan and Michael would talk about it. And they've put out plenty of material on Twitter, on YouTube, and in the docs talking about this. And, um, you know, I think there's a really cool aspect of it. When you are learning Remix, you are learning to rely on like the fundamentals of the web, HTML as a first step and HTTP as a second. And I say that because HTML is a first step. You know, th this is something I remember from Ed Faulkner actually in, in the um, in our Ember days is that HTML is actually the language of the web because HTML is what browsers can comprehend. You can't give a browser a JavaScript document. 
browsers read HTML and HTMLs initialize things like JavaScript documents and style sheet, uh, style sheets like CSS style sheets or images or other resources. But when you type in an address, you load an HTML document, which is why when they were doing the bundler, interestingly in Ember, it was HTML first. And that's also actually um, how, uh, what is it? There's a new, what's the new bundler? They're not a new bundler, but maybe it's, there's some new, one of the new like things that's not Webpack. Webpack was like JS first and using JavaScript imports to create the graph, but there's other tools. And I think there's, I can't think of it right now, but that use HTML to link it because browsers already do that. And browsers do that with input, like browsers basically do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I understand what you're saying. I'm just internally laughing a little because you're like browsers understand HTML, not JavaScript, but then then our earliest Ember apps, we would literally ship one line in the HTML file. It was a script tag to our Ember app. We're not doing that anymore, are we? <laughs> I, yeah. And for good reason. That's true. That is true. You know? But I just find it, you know, you it's gotta, like the it, init, it, HTML is the init script. The bootstrapped. Or, it, the bootstrap. Yeah, but again, now it's more than that, right? And that's kind yeah. of part of what this whole conversation is. Anyways, I wanted to call that out because I think it's a good aspect of the remix philosophy in the docs is that Right, it goes beyond using HTML. It's not just making like a philosophical point or some interesting idea. It's talking about the fact that we already have a system in place with every browser and every HTML document that is linked to each other to create like the graph that creates a structure and a backbone of the user flow through your site. And that comes based on the architecture that the web is already based on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now that we're in a world where even though we're making JavaScript apps, React apps, whatever, um, that aren't just bootstrapped, uh, that it's like it can be, our apps can be more resilient if we use that as a foundation, basically. Can I, I haven't thought about this as much as you have, but just what I'm hearing from you is like browsers understand HTML, they're good at HTML and it's easy for browsers to like link to other pages, link to other documents. And that's essentially like you're describing an application, a yeah. bundle. And so if we rely on the browser, um, things get easier. Exactly. Think about, um, you've seen like state machines and like think libraries like X state as a way to describe every possible flow through your application and how tools like that can actually help you think about them. Because if you were to try to make, you know, I've seen like Ryan Florence talk about this with respect to like his, uh, his like ARIA accessible, like UI components, because like the states that an autocomplete search box can be in are crazy. If you've ever tried to make something like that, it's wild in terms of like, Oh, I forgot they could be tabbing while the list is fetching from the server. I was actually watching some of our old Ember concurrency videos and um, it's a lot of the same kind of thing, right? So everyone who's done any UI programming knows that uh, anytime you introduce state, especially asynchronous state in like a, an environment that is long running as opposed to like a series of steps, which is what UI programming is. And that's like, that's where concurrency comes from. And that's what makes it so hard is that you, the more states you introduce, it's like state is the root of all evil, right? And the more states you introduce, you have this combinatorial explosion of all the paths between the different states. Because you can go from A to B, B exactly. to C, A to C. Exactly, exactly. And when we were using jQuery to like slide things down and open things, imperatively, that we saw, you see like the result of that, which is it's even harder to manage these states because you are now imperatively worrying about the transitions. Then you move to something like React, which is declarative, and you learn how much more a tool like React that's declarative can help you make sure that your states, you don't get into a bad state and the, tr the transitions between the states are taken care of for you. That's like this whole path, right? Of like mm -hmm. moving away from imperative controls, like jQuery slide down to having UI as a function of state in react, which is a declarative model. Well, if you can, if there's interactions in your app that can be represented as HTML documents with hyperlinks between them, you can just take that part of your entire user flow interaction out of your own code and then let the browser do that for you. So that's what's cool about tools like Remix and then even more so like the server components because um, you, if you were to just like show all of the states and the transitions between the states in your entire app, 
and you had to do them all yourself on the client with JavaScript, there's a lot you have to think about, right? If you click on a link that loads data and then renders a page, what happens if you click a button while that transition is happening? What happens if you click back or cancel? If you had to recreate all that yourself, it'd be really hard. Then you could have a framework like that has a router do it for you. But even a step beyond that is to just let the browser do it for you because there's even more things built in like cancellation, whatever, loading UI, and just in general, like a more resilient user experience. So that's kind of how I see this, which is like, let's, if we could list out all of the states and the states, the pathways through those states of our application, are there some that we were recreating that we actually don't need to now that we've kind of gone to this pendulum swing and we can go back and can we rely on HTML, which is declarative and HTTP, which is request response, which we know so many good things come out of that and use those for the things like the basic interactions, like navigation and form submissions without giving up the productivity that we've gotten from using unified tools like Ember, like React, where we have one paradigm for doing all of our stuff, which is why so many of us like doing that in the first place, because we have a single paradigm, both for loading data from a database and rendering it in a list and also writing like an autocomplete search box. Yeah, doing animation. Doing animation, exactly. So that's a beautiful part of the docs. I think it's something that people should, um, would be good for people to understand and learn and take away. Um, but you know, there's part of it, there's part of the docs that I was kind of talking about and got into some conversation on Twitter about, uh, that's like, oh, like this is how the web's always worked. And, uh, you know, we really like have overcomplicated things in the last five, 10 years. And, um, you can kind of hear this both from people. There are some people, I guess there's some sentiment in the remix docs that kind of give off this feeling. And then there's people outside of like JavaScript who kind of say this about the JavaScript ecosystem as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I, I wanted to make this point because it was something that, you know, Yehuda and Tom said back in the day when we, when I was learning like UI development with Ember is, um, when you think about it, if you really truly limited all of your coding to the server side, the browser basically gives you two forms of user interaction, which is links and forms. That's like all the browser understands. If you don't write any JavaScript or if you don't execute any JavaScript, that's like all, I mean, you can like, I guess you can upload like a file or like render an image, right? But like a user interaction, like it's a I form. Mean, that's a form. Files, a that's form. a form, yeah. right, exactly. So if you want to like drag a card, um, if you want to like hover a Trello card and drag it to a column or drag an event on Google calendar, right. Or even like open an email in Gmail, um, without like re-rendering the whole page, there is some JavaScript somewhere that has to be doing something in, in order for that to work. But you're saying because that cannot be expressed in the form of a link. Exactly. Or a form. Exactly. And I was kind of talking about this and saying like, yeah, we like, do you think apps like Trello and Gmail, uh, not even like Figma, right? But like, do you think apps like like Trello and, and Gmail should be able to be written as web applications, right? Even Twitter, um, you know, liking a tweet without refreshing the page. Uh, if you, again, and again, so that I, I kind of wanted to talk about this because I think maybe I just said it quickly or people haven't really heard this before. And so I, I wanted to be clear about what I was actually saying, which is if you literally have no JavaScript running, you can't like a tweet with just HTML and a server. If you clicked a tweet like button that submitted a form, then the whole page would refresh. It would submit the form and it would like the tweet, the functionality would work, but the user experience wouldn't uh, be the same thing. Obviously you wouldn't be able to get the scroll position back unless you submitted it as part of like the form and but you wouldn't be able to restore it without JavaScript probably because all the tweets wouldn't be loaded because they're not tied to a queer print. You'd have some like anchor tag. I'm You're, just thinking like, yeah, how do I yeah, hack this right, thing? But exactly. yes, a hundred percent. You are not going to make apps like Trello. If you literally do not have JavaScript running, you can't respond to an on drag event because that happens on the client. So I just wanted to make this just logically. We're thinking very like, just very, um, like pe almost pedant, not pedantically, just very, I'm saying something very specific, which is you don't have JavaScript. You can't write a drag handler. You can't submit data without refreshing the page because you need Ajax, all these things. 
And so, you know, the sentiment that like all the work that has the front end community has been trying to do, you know, is, is in service of trying to make these kind of good experiences. And then some people would say things like, you know, um, well, of course, I mean, I would model Gmail with links and forms or even Twitter, right? Like a like button is a form and clicking a, a tweet is a link. I get that. And again, that's kind of like the cool part of like Remix, which is making it clear that you actually can use that as like the bones and the skeleton and then dress it up. But to dress it up and make these user experiences that are qualitatively different than like a full refresh server, truly only server rendered app, um, it takes a lot of JavaScript, obviously. And um, even if the bones of something like Twitter or Gmail are links and forms, which is how you should think about it, how you should model it in your mind, you, you still need JavaScript in order to actually create the experience or the drag and drop, right? Mm -hmm. You write the JavaScript that responds to the drag handler, you drop it, which submits a form in theory. The model is that it submits a form and um, you, know, you created a new card and you highlight it and the URL changes. So that's a link, right, that you're following. But the point is you need the front end code to do all of that stuff. So that's why people want, even want a paradigm. Even people who use server-side technologies like Phoenix want a live view, right? Yes, you're modeling the user interactions. You're using links and forms where you can, but there's a lot more that goes beyond that. As you're describing this, it reminds me of what you said to start off this conversation where when we had you know, backbone and we're describing all the transitions, uh, it's really, really hard. And then we get this declarative model with React and it becomes easy because React, we just described the states and React just takes care of the transitions. Yes. What I'm hearing now is that uh, if we were to like build these forms ourselves, like trying to build the like button on Twitter and it's a link, but it submits it to like an anchor tag to restore form submission. That's like the imperative yes. transition in between steps. Yes. But what you're describing with Remix is it takes care yes. of all that stuff. It lets you think in the model of submitting a form or doing a link exactly. navigation, but it can take care of all the the JavaScript, all the, the in, what I like to call like the in-between. Yes. And you just get to describe the states. Yes. Okay, that, that is totally like, that, what you just said is like the best pitch it is. for Remix right. that, that I've ever heard. So. Right, but right, and, 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 and so it should, and so the thing that I was kind of, you know, I was like, I woke up at like one o'clock because my back and I was up for five hours. So I, this, was, this was 4 a.m. Sam tweeting from the couch. So I, you know, I was maybe a little grumpy, but whatever. I think it's still, it was, and, and you know, I, I love Remix and I love the folks behind it, but there is this notion, there's a, a somewhat of a sentiment in, in the docs that uh, um, it's like you submit a form in your front end framework and you have to do on submit and it's like you prevent default and it's like you just prevented all this stuff that you shouldn't be preventing and you have to do it yourself now. Now there's part of that that's true, but the reason people started doing that is because, well, if I prevent default and I'm in my front end code, look at all this cool stuff I can do, right? I can do animation. I can do animation, I can respond to a drag handler. When you submit, I can open a dialog that makes sure that you wanna submit or makes you have to hold something down or shows an undo button or whatever, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. Obviously, there's reasons that people have done this. I think the most constructive way to talk about this stuff is to show why it helps you make the kind of apps that most front end developers get excited about apps that do have animation and have cards that you can drag and keyboard shortcuts that change little parts of the screen or a persistent video player remix should make those things easier. And it does, it makes those things easier. Um, because in the same way that react made those things easier because react is letting you, uh, instead of giving you this crazy powerful imperative API, I'm actually this is a good this is like a good analogy, right? If you went on this journey and React was like not your first but your second, right? Or Ember was like my second, jQuery was the first or Backbone, like you said, jQuery and Backbone give you like all of these imperative APIs. You learn JavaScript and you're like feeling superpower. Then you go and you make. I remember my first like rich JavaScript app was like this single page survey at 
my job in, in Boston, actually, outside of Boston. And you could filter and sort the responses. It was from like a financial company and all their, they, had, they wanted to drill down and all this stuff and the charts would upload, you know, they change and the router changes and like you go back and then there's this bug because I'm like literally calling push state and I'm like made an old state machine and all this crazy stuff to try to get this thing to work. Then you discover like Ember and it's like, holy crap, you know, like there's a router that does all this. Ember or React or all these, these frameworks let you still go to town when you need to do imperative code on my D3 charts and do whatever I want to do. But the stuff that's common, like this state is represented by this URL, um, or, you know, this button and this button both change the same state over here that should make this other thing open or close. Now I can wrap those messy parts in the declarative parts. And as soon as I'm wrapped in declarative land, the framework can take off so much of this work off my hands for yep. me. So there's this transition that you go from like 100% of my code is imperative and hand rolled to like whatever, 80% is wrapped in declarative parts. And now my, my app is way more resilient. It's way easier to build all these crazy things because I can introduce even more states now that the framework can just take care of for me. Hitting the back button works, all this stuff. So I think this is how people should, this is how like frameworks like Remix should talk about what they're doing. And instead sometimes it's like it feels like we should have never gone on this path in the first place in reality it's like you should look at a gmail or a trello and say listen it's awesome that you did that but let's look at your code and see how hard it was for you to on drag move this thing detect this thing here let it go and then how do you like what do you do at that point how, how, how do you save the new data how do you refresh things Look, actually, you might have not thought about this, but liking a tweet on the timeline is the same thing as like creating a new user in your backend admin. It's actually can be models of form submission. This is just like when Rails was like teaching us that like, how do you log in? Like you don't send a, a patch request to like slash login. You actually post to session. Like creating a session is how you can model these user interactions in HTTP that already gives us so much. So liking a tweet, can be represented as a form. That's brilliant, right? But you shouldn't stop there and you shouldn't teach the form and link clicking websites and then say, oh yeah, we can get fancy if we want, let's add this later. That's like, that's the only reason people are doing this in the first place and the links and forms are there to make that easier. Okay, so you're sorry, that was like a long No, that was, that was good. So you're saying in a way, when you read these docs, it's like, we need to go back to our roots. And, but you feel the opposite where it's like, no, you, you've just, this, discovered an abstraction that yes. eliminates so much code. Yes. And it is true. Like, I don't, I, if you were like, is clicking a, an image on Twitter that likes a tweet the same as submitting like a, a multi-page form? I would be like, yeah, maybe, may, I don't know. I wouldn't know the answer to that, but you just very elegantly. Dude, and there's it so is. much that you get if you can model yeah, a it's like, a whole abstraction. That it's a whole just, abstraction. You submit a form. Oh, what does that do? That refreshes, that revalidates other parts of the page. Again, because it's modeled. Mm -hmm. How does a form submission work in HTML and HTTP? The page should reload. The page should reload. And it that's so if you're aware of what all does the, that get you? If you're aware of all the data fetches that yeah. your page makes, you just you can refresh. Exactly. And that's how it's all modeled. Like all of it, right? Yep. So you're trying to think, I'm doing this drag and drop operation. But now you're like, okay, what are the skeletons of bones I have to work with? Because if I go outside of those, this part of my app is not going to feel as resilient and robust and be as easy as the things that are easily identifiable as links and forms in a normal app. But it turns out, right, logging in can be represented as submitting a form, right? Liking mm -hmm. a, a tweet can be represented. Um, and then they give you the layers to do like the optimistic UI and the spinners and stuff. But the docs literally say things like, at this point, you can just reload the document and like the browser will give you the loading spinner and uh, like you can be done if you don't have if you're if that, that's all you want to do, then you're done. And it's actually a pretty good user experience. And it's like, ho hold on a second. Wait, wait, like <laughs> if I like a tweet and the page refreshes, that's not a good loading experience. Like we can do better than that. That's yeah. why people are making the that's why anyone cares to do anything more than what you can do with just server links and forms mm -hmm. because you can't make these rich interactive apps that we all love to use. Like there's a reason people, the apps that people use like 
care about details like this because it makes it a lot more pleasant to use. So, and I see a lot of people say things like, oh, I'm making like, an, I want to make like a web app that's like really nice and it has like all of these like, you know, um, like really detailed polished UX similar to like an app. Um, and like, so Remix is like not a good fit. I want to make an app. So I need something like, you know, whatever, Next.js or, or whatever people say. And you see like some of the Remix folks in the community say like, no, you can do all that stuff. But if you look at the guys or you look at a lot of the demos that you see, it's like, it's sometimes you have to dig for that stuff. And you might walk away if you were to just read some of the guys that I was reading for this particular part of the, of the course that we're working on. Like, and it's like, wait, that, that's it, right? But no, I wanna make something like, so the, so the course that we're making, it's gonna end up with something that resembles like an Ember app, right? Which is what I think of as like, it's like a rich client app that's like, but it actually happens to be built on code split HTML with links and forms as like this backbone, which you is like kind of mind yeah. blowing. So because you're that's not gonna, awesome. You're not going to say, okay, well now I want an animation, so I'm going to delete my form exactly. and I'm going to create an on-submit Exactly, handle. exactly. Which really? is really, really cool. It is cool. You know, before, if you had asked me before we recorded today what I like best about Remix, I think I would say something like kind of what you were, what the guides say, where yeah. it's like, we get, we gave up a lot writing JavaScript applications, like to load data, we have to go create an API endpoint, write an effect to fetch data from there, you know, create a submit handler, then call fetch to get that back over to our API endpoint that writes data. It's just like a lot of wiring and Remix is great because this is again, what I always said before this part, right. because it gives us loader action. It cuts out all the, that middleman stuff, but right. this, this you're, you're definitely motivating me. <clears throat> and now it's more like there's an abstraction here that lets us just basically use the same, uh, help me out here. Like use it's the same It's almost like bottle. what you're saying, but it's different. The goal is not to remove all that stuff because all that stuff exactly. is there because it's giving us a user experience that we want. The benefit is that you get the user experience. The benefit of Remix is that you get to build the user experience, but the 80% of the stuff that is fundamentally the same as how browsers work, if you can actually squint and see the abstraction, yeah. is now given to you. And so you don't have to write that anymore. So they've thought very carefully about how to give you layer in abstractions on top of the fundamentals of HTTP and HTML so that you can write your form without all that stuff because all you want is a set state is loading so you can render a spinner on the button. Now you can layer that on using, you know, use fetcher or whatever, you know, you whatever that I haven't gotten there yet, but you have your form and because it's like, the declarative HTML model form, it takes care of back forward cancellation submission. There's one state, there's one state. You're not preventing default anything, but you want to show some UI. Again, if you are in a justice server rendered app, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. All you get is a loading spinner in the browser, which is not good. I was mentioning this in a conversation on Twitter. Remember Leo, Leo and Danya, my friends, mm -hmm. Leo was saying, uh, uh, he's like, I remember there was some point where like, I'm like, if I'm using a website and I like press a button and it doesn't like show me that it's like spinning and it's working and it feels broken, even though like, I like websites used to not do that ever, but like now it's just how it feels, right? People are expectations change, yeah. especially with native apps over time. And so that's something you want. And so it was awesome when we, you know, backbone and Ember and React came along because you can on submit, prevent default, set is loading true. And now look at that. I get to do my own loading in Chrome and I don't have to just wait for the browser to make something better or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Remix basically came and said, look, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's get the baby back, which is the form and let the browser do what it does best. And then here's an abstraction for the stuff that you actually care about right? Animations and spinners and other parts of the UI updating in JavaScript, whatever you want to do in your React components. But let's talk about it like that because we want to end up with the same app. I want to show you how much easier it is to get there. The point is not that, that we're going to like, we're going to go back to making apps the way we did 10 years ago because we don't want to do that. 
I don't, it, dude, this is so interesting. Because <laughs> no one the, wants to do that. The reason that I stopped doing Rails. That's not rail, a carrot. The reason I stopped doing Rails and started doing Ember is because I had all these requests to do the rich clients yeah. and stuff. That's yeah. a reason that I had to move over. So that's, that's obviously the stuff right. that excites me about JavaScript. And you did it in spite of how painful it was and what you knew you were well, giving like, up. But you, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, because I always wanted the Rails for JavaScript, blah, yes, blah, blah. Exactly. <laughs> But now it definitely feels like, oh, let's go back. Let's go back to PHP. Let's right. go back to loading data on right. the server. Look at all how great all that stuff is. But this is making me, you're making me realize it's like, no, you actually want to keep going forward. Yes. The next level forward yes. is remix yes. the abstractions that come when you, yes. you share the data fetching. So the app knows all the data that's loaded. When you share the routing, the app knows exactly like what part of the tree you're in. Super interesting. We did on submit prevent default because people wanted to do cool stuff in the client. They didn't know any different. They didn't know how else to do right, it. Like, right, right. We have to stop the browser from doing what it does because, like, when the user clicks submit, I want to like fade away the form. So I need to like prevent default, fade away the form. Okay, now I actually have to get the data to the server. So like, let's get the data into React state and like let's make a fetch call and like await it. Okay, we have to make sure like we don't set state on an unmounted component. So that right, yep. you've entangled all of these concerns. You're just figuring it out. And then you realize after doing this for years and years, oh, what if we can model the part that is like the structure of what's happening here with like the the UX polish, the enhanced UX. It's, it's and actually, you can actually pull those apart. When you look at it from that lens, it's super interesting to think that Remix is a build, Remix's building blocks are what unlock that so form component, right. action, right. loader, right. and a router. Yep, yep. yep. As real, yep. that yep. that is like kind yep. of like the minimum. Yes. Because I would, I, you know, one of yes. the things one of the things I didn't understand about Remix when I first got started, where I was like, why doesn't this have a model layer? Why don't they? say oh, this is how you load data you use prisma and we right. have like but it, they don't they'd say like you can just load create a file called async lib. function is the lowest level yeah, common exactly. denominator as create opposed lib to like, user right. and fetch your user you want to fetch it from an api endpoint or right. prisma do whatever you want right and i right, was right. like why, why can't they be more opinionated but the, right. you're making me realize well their opinions are about the the, the ui it, it's the, the ui being able to react to like form submissions yes. and all that not about the the, um, I was going to say data loading model data. changes the model, how, how you model your data. They call Yes. They call it center stack. They want to cover the network. So it's center stack, right? Mm -hmm. They were originally talking about remix working without react. I have no idea if that's still a thing, but it could be because they want to cover the center of the stack, which is like not front end, not, not, it's not full stack rails is like full stack because it comes with, like you're saying, database adapters, right? Mailers, yep. um, remix is like the center of the stack react is the front end and then your back end is whatever you want. But the common denominator there is like you just said, it's an async action. It's an async function as an action for form submissions It's an async function as a loader for link navigations and, um, and you a know, router. and a router exactly that can navigate between the two and that is, that is HTTP. That's how HTTP works. And HTML is like kind of the, the declarative way to do that, which is why request response is so nice, which is what we were talking about in our episode of moving build UI there, because now you have one state to deal with. The network takes care of all that. And then you can offload even more to like the browser or in this case, the form component in terms of cancellations and back and forth and all that stuff. Cool. Super interesting. I have two, two yeah. questions for you. Which one are we first? So, okay. The first one is, Okay, we've been talking about Remix. What do you think about like other things that are trying to solve this, like uh, Phoenix and what is their version mm, of this? Live, live view. view and doesn't Laravel? Laravel has something to live, live wire, wire something. Like that. Yeah. Are, mm -hmm. Do you would you say that these are all trying to solve the same problem in a sense that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, are these all trying to solve mm -hmm. the same problem? Mm -hmm. They're trying mm -hmm. to cut, mm -hmm. find that abstraction between right. like submitting a form and data ending up in a database. Right, right, right. Interesting. What's the second question? In case it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> second question is: um, So you're doing a course right now on yeah. building a work journal. What interactions are you going to add, or what are you thinking you're yeah, going to yeah, add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That really, is easier. They I'm really take show this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, and it actually, it's. I'm glad you asked that because it's. I kind of want to wind up what I was saying, which is like the main takeaway. Once you internalize this, this is the approach: is that you want to. So 
we have an animations course. We animate things like an email inbox and a multi-step form and an image gallery. And the best way to do animations, no matter what tools or frameworks or libraries you're using, is to make your code work first without animation and then to layer animation in it. Frame or Motion, the library we teach, does a particularly good job at this because it has declarative APIs that work very well with React's already declarative kind of structure. And so you have an image carousel, you flip next and it, it shows you the next one. There's no animation, it's just showing you the next index. How do you do that? A React developer would know to model that as like an index state um, that you call set on when you increment it or decrement it, right? Maybe it's the active index in like an array of pictures. So you do all that, you make it work. Now you can layer in the animation, which is like, okay, Frame of Motion does an awesome job of this. When I'm going from zero to one, we have like the outgoing image, the incoming image. And so how do you want me to handle those? But fundamentally the bones, the skeleton is all declarative in React and the imperative stuff is like layered on. But that's how you should actually build these too. You should make your app work without animations, period, before adding them uh, so that you make sure you've modeled it correctly within um, a perspective of React. So it's the same way in the course. So to answer your question, we want to get the thing working first. The way we're starting this is like we're starting on the first user flow. It's like the idea of the epicenter from like the product folks at Basecamp where we're starting a new work journal app. What's the first thing a user would want to do? Well, same thing you would do if you bought a new journal from the store and you sat down to write your first entry. That's right there. Boom, we just found it. So the first user flow in the app is writing your first entry. You want to open it up and you want to see a form where you can create your first entry. You give it a date, you give it a tag, and then you write some text and then you submit it. So that's what we're building right now. We're going to build all that. It's going to work using like, I want some term for this, like crude forms and links, you know, <laughs> like inert forms and links, like basically disable JavaScript and the app should work, right? I want to make another little mini rant right here too, because you see a lot of things about progressive enhancement, which is a way to divide a fan base is <laughs> just to mention the word progressive fan base, uh, progressive Sorry. enhancement. Um, but some people will try to browbeat you with that term. Again, I think that's less effective way to, than to say, uh, the reason you want your, your app to work without JavaScript is because that means that you actually know you use the, the paradigm correctly and you use the primitives right. And if you show me your app and it doesn't work without JavaScript, uh, I'm going to be able to find a bug in it a lot easier than in my app. So if your app works, that means like you actually understand what the form and links do that, that I'm giving you in the router. You've modeled everything correctly. And now you can layer in the polish. You can use a fetcher or submitter or whatever to get the, the, the spinner in it. You can do optimistic updates. All of those things layer on top of the bones, the skeleton, which is built off of these like rock solid HTTP fundamentals. Um, and you know, our apps break all the time. I mean, like, look at Twitter, right? It doesn't even load this morning. Things break, things mess up. You lose networks. It's good. There's a re and it's just simpler too. It's not to browbeat you, make you feel bad that your app doesn't work uh, without JavaScript because it should work for someone who has like a low end phone. It's because it's going to make your life easier. It's such a more effective Dude, way to convince me. <laughs> I don't know. And it's also true. It's also true. I don't know a single de single person, family member, developer, whoever <laughs> that browses the web with JavaScript disabled. Exactly. So I don't do not care about it. Yeah. Soon I just like, yeah. I fall asleep when you make that argument. Yeah. But if you say, if you don't build like this, I'll be able to find a bug in yeah. your code. Yep. Boom, I'm, I'm all yours. Yep. Yeah. So uh, in that spirit, we are building the work journal creation process, user flow first. And then we're going to say, okay, you know, I want it to like, I want to have all my entries in a sidebar. I want it to feel like an app. You know, I, and I think that's kind of where we're going to end up because on my website, it's just like a pretty simple list. But I think I want to I want it to feel like an app where, you know, you like fade it in in a list of the sidebar and you can like click all these entries. I could like maybe select multiple entries and like delete them all. And like the app just is like it's very app like, you know, Brian Levin actually has a website with his like blog posts and it just looks and feels awesome. Um, I was kind of thinking about maybe stealing some of those kind of design <laughs> Uh, de like design decisions he made um, or even just like a remi like the reminders app or like the mail the native app because like you can do all that's this cool thing you can do all that stuff and no matter what we do 
in terms of the UX and UI polish that we add, it will still fundamentally be modeled off of remix form, the links in the router. In the same way that no matter how we animate those carousel, the images in the carousel, it's still going to have a single piece of React state that's React like a selected state, yeah. index. Really good. So, yeah. So that's so that's to answer your second question in terms of where going. It's going to be. There's a lot of. I have a lot of ideas about what I want to do there, but to start, we don't. You don't have to think about that, which is nice too because it's just simpler to get it working. And how how awesome to get an app working based on these fundamental primitives. And it is awesome. You have to write a lot less code and like you have a working app. And now the exciting part is like adding the UX stuff to it. It's not because this is what we're going to ship. Yeah. Right? Also too, when you, when you build the third feature in an app and the primitives are the same as the first or the second, it's motivating. You know what you need to do. Yes. You can jump right into yes. the fourth feature. When you build that third feature, and you look back at this, it's different from the second. It's like, wait, like you just different mental model, different way of thinking through it. And then that's different from the first. That's draining. You often try to like find the abstraction between yes. all three. You go off and do your own refactor. Then you start building feature four. It doesn't fit into that abstraction. And this is a side project that takes eight months and never, never sees the light of day. So yeah, I, you know, that's one of the things I loved about Rails is no matter what I was doing, it was always model controller view they all look the same uh, like you said earlier 10 rails apps generally look the same uh, so yeah that's dude, really that that is the stuff that, like as a programmer really excites me dude that's so it's so funny that you said that because um you remember when we were like just getting into react i was working on my recipes app and we actually sat down and paired together on it i had like wired up it probably wouldn't have been SWR at the time, but it was something like it. And we built a feature like, and it was just, it looked very similar. It looked very similar. And you literally stopped after we, and you were like, that is like the first time I felt like this was like a Rails app experience. Whereas it's exactly what you just said, which was like, I just know what to do next. I think it was the recipes app, like my cooking recipes yeah, app. Yeah, that was one of the first It was ones. one of the first ones where maybe it was something else. Maybe it was a fitness app. Maybe it was like last summer we were pairing on a feature and I had like the data fetching and it, it looked the same. And like we added a feature without having to like, oh, this was like a form, but this is like a button tap and it's like totally different. It's kind of like what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, I think that's a really cool thing. Exactly like the Rails stuff where it's like, once you learn to think in that paradigm, you just created a new blog post and now you need to sign the user in and you're like, I'm screwed. But actually, nope, you're not. You need a sessions controller and you need to post to it. And you're creating a resource. And actually everything a user can do can be modeled as a create, read, or a delete on a resource. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's kind of what you're All saying. All this overhead. All just, of this overhead just left. left. And now when you go to a new problem, how can I model it in terms of these things? Which is why experienced developers like Michael and Ryan can look at liking a tweet and say, that's a form submission. Even though a lot of people would say, wait, but that's a button on click. Oh, button on click. I need to save data to the server though. Like, does this live in React state? Okay, so I need some React state. But like I need to send a message to the server and like I need to update the likes. So that's in React state. So I'm going to use an effect. It's like I'm screwed because now like I'm just going to make a form and make this a lot easier, a degraded user experience, not an enhanced one, because this is so hard because I have an effect and I'm syncing the state with the URL. But actually, the problem is you're not thinking about it in the right paradigm. And maybe you didn't have the primitives that could be modeled in that way either. When you have the primitives and you understand the paradigm, you can look at any interaction and say, oh, that can be modeled just like this form or link basically accounts for 99% of it, right, um, as the skeleton. So uh, I think it's a really cool way to think about Remix and also about the server components, which we were going to talk about, but look at, look at that. We're about 50 minutes in. Um, I think there's, I think it's a very, it's very powerful. It's basically like the idea of a good abstraction, right? They, the best abstractions are ones that don't leak or leak le the least amount, right? Dude, this is totally giving me just just from backbone to React vibes. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know that's like, you say that now, you know, seven years later, and everyone's just like, yeah, of course. But it's it's only obvious in hindsight. Of course. Yes. So that's so, where like the cynical take, it's not being, they're not being charitable with like how, first of all, how awesome. Yeah, there's, there's a lot here. Um, 
it's not just writing apps like we did 10 years ago. And, and again, if you just had a server, going back to the original thing that started all this, people weren't quite understanding when I was saying all you have is forms and links. That is literally all you have if you don't have JavaScript. That is literally all you have. There's, that's, I'm not making it, it's not an opinion. I'm just saying that's actually all you have. So if you want to handle I mean, user events on the front end, you need a front end code to be running. And so this is where the kind of history, the development of this is like, well, now we move more code to the front end. How can we move the code and do things in the front end we want to do to enhance the user experience without giving up this fundamental thing? And it's like, we're in this process of discovering what, that, what does the nervous system look like of a web app? This is, this is a big part of it, right? This is like... Yeah. When you say all we have is forms and links, it just makes me want to like, okay, I'm going to load images, but I'm going to use CSS to hide some of those images. Yeah, and yeah. My server can see like, oh, yeah, that right. image was never oh, requested. And now I can do this like ternary <laughs> logic and get around your forms and links right, rule. Right, exactly. Really good, really good. Um, cool, so that was like your second question. Then the first question, why don't we end it there, I guess. I mean, I guess we can speak really, I guess we could speak it's all right if you don't like I the server component something... stuff I wanted to talk. I was going to say, should we go into the server component stuff or should we no, save no, no, that we should, for we next week? Say, yeah. The only thing I wanted to say about server components, we were going to read a bunch of these tweets because Dan did a lot of cool um, writing over the past like five. Dan Abramov did a lot of cool writing in the past five or six days about server components. And one of the things that I was proud of myself for feeling like I grokked at the beginning of seeing React server components and Next was like, First of all, it's confusing how they mix together and it feels in a very similar way to mixing on submit, prevent default, run an animation, save data. Yeah, isn't that great? That's all everything what we wanna do. Actually, you wanna disentangle the, the bones, which is a persistence, which can be modeled as a form and the enhanced UX that can work alongside of it. With Next and React server components, it can look like it's all jumbled together because I need state, so I need a client component. I wanna load data, so I need server, right? The, we can talk more about it next week, but the server components that make up your tree is kind of like a skeleton actually. And uh, we've done some pairing with folks and worked on, on some next 13 apps with some folks, app directory apps. And um, I called this, I think it's gonna be the best way to learn this, but in the same way that you make a remix app, a feature using forms and links in the router, and then you enhance it, right? With the UX that you want using the full power of React, which is the same way you do animation. You do it with React first, declarative, no animation, you layer the animation. I think the best way pedagogically to teach Next13 app directory um, or in the future, other frameworks that use React server components is gonna be to make your entire, your, your make a feature that works only with server components. Yes. So no React client components at all, because that is the bones and it's for similar reasons that forms and links are the bones of a Remix app. Um, it also helps you understand in the same re for the same way, for the same reason you wanna use forms and links in a Remix app heavily, because it's gonna let the framework take a lot of the work for you. If you rely on server components for things that server components can do, and again, server components only run on the server and they can't do anything other than respond to form submissions and handle links. I mean, right now they can't even respond to form they submissions, yeah, but there's going to be a mutation API, right? Added to react server components. They're like working on an RFC for it. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's what they've said anyways. Yeah, they, they, yes. But in they're theory, working. they're running on the server so they can handle a post request, right? Or whatever from the browser, right? and they can load data, they can do that today. So you should be able to build a feature using React server components. And if you have only ever built SPAs with React on the client and done all of that work yourself, prevent default, blah, 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 you should have the same epiphany that you would have if you were to use Remix today and learn that wow, shit, there's all these states that I was worried about and that were causing my app to not be resilient and break down a bunch. When I let the React server component do the loading job and the revalidating after mutation and the, the links and all this stuff, man, there's like so much less that I have to do. I mean, there should be, so, it should yeah. feel completely simpler, way easier. That should be the same effect. 
So I think the way to learn these, like all these people were kind of just talking about there's, and again, we wanted to go through this. We can do it next week. A lot of people are like, what's the point of React server components? Like we have like a loader or whatever, like what's the point of all, we can do it with a framework. Next has got server side props I can use to load data in the, in the server in node. Why do I need a React server component? I think this idea of like building a feature with like these server components as like the bones of the tree and then adding, layering in the client side functionality is going to be a great way to understand what work they're doing, the benefits they bring and why it's like a better approach. So mm -hmm. I like what you said. I think we need to see the mutation API. Um, I know in a server component, if you do like on submit or on click, it's just like, yeah, yeah it needs yeah. to be client components. So right. like there might just, I, by the way, if I was teaching someone a web app, that's right. like just any, just web technology. That's what we would teach, like right. the low level stuff. Right, so right, 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 right. That's just to say that, um, I'm not Super sure hand wavy right now. Right, I'm not no... sure where, like, do you naturally find yourself in a client component mm -hmm. as soon as you want to submit a form mm -hmm. or is, mm -hmm. is it that not the case? See, I would TBD. love, yeah, totally. Um, totally. You would love like a, I would love like a, server like i am building a server app and there's no like client-side code until i need client-side code yeah you have like the new tweet button it's a form and it's again all server components shows a form you click tweet and uh you submit the form and um uh i'm not really sure what it would do if it would do something before i guess it would wait i mean you could just Let's say you could just do the mutation in the in the body of the component or something like that. And you can check if it's the first time it's rendered. So like if you refresh it, you know, like those airplane websites when you refresh, you sure you want to post request this yeah, again? Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. Remix yeah. has stuff to deal with all this because that's you're building on the back of the browser. But you could imagine checking in the component if this is like a post request, if it's the first time, if there's like a flash message, whatever, all that stuff that's in like Rails. But let's just say you could do that, right? You tweet it, you can build twitter clone with a tweet form you submit it and then it re-renders like the home page feed right then you're like i want the new tweet modal to show up as a modal like the tw new tweet now, form now i layer use it. client layered yeah. in but submitting it the feed is in the back it's a react server component that's loading it but in the same way that a full page refresh naturally will revalidate you know evict the cat whatever the caching stuff this will just kind of do the same thing. So um, it is interesting. But now yeah, it's even but, but cooler the, but, but, because you're not even just tied to the URL because server components and client components compose as well as only client components. So like clients, components have worked out very well from a composition perspective in React better than any other front end paradigm, period. So now you can talk about having like the number of likes be a server component that is revalidated and fetch data, right? And then when you hover it, it shows like a tool tip that's a client component, but like fundamentally you could build the like count or whatever, it originally was just part of a server component, you know? Right. Um, but as you layer in the client component interactivity, you, you're not, again, you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You still get fundamentally the revalidated queries, live queries or whatever, you know, the data fetching is on the server, the links are, request response and so you're not preventing default and dealing with all the in-between states and the cancellations yeah. so I, that's like a pitch that's like the dream or whatever anyways we can talk more about it next week but yeah i think a big question for me is like how much of what you described is up to the framework versus being up to server components and i think that's an area where like i don't know who can answer that now what, mm -hmm. what the answer to that is what right. it looks like right um yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. all for it though. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, what do you say we wrap it there? Oh, right, your question, which I'm clearly trying to dodge. I want to think more about this. Question is basically, do you like live wire, live view, and even like hot wire? There's a, there's a, there's a the wires. Venn diagram. You choose live or wire, and you see which server side framework has chosen the two. So now you have like hot view. Hot view is going to be the next one from uh, Django or something. <laughs> I really think it's live view, live wire and hot wire are like, you know, these like turbo, like turbo links 3.0 or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, just more, more. I don't know if they are. I want to think about this. Yes. They're trying to give you a way to, um, add enhance your UX, right. 
progressive enhancement, enhance the UX with richer UI UX features. Um, I'm not sure the goal is to like have a unified paradigm with how you're doing things on the back end already. Whereas if you read Dan's talks and tweets and thoughts on React server components, um, he's actually like less interested in React uh, as a specific technology versus the general idea of basically what is the abstraction that lets you unify the paradigm, right? And um, let you move back and forth and like the server boundary, the server client boundary becomes like incidental and so as opposed to like the focus. Whereas I think like Hotwire, it's gonna do a lot of the same things or live view or whatever. I don't really know as much about the Phoenix stuff like I know Herman, my friend uses that and it's like pretty crazy what you can do with it. But again, I'm not sure it's the same. I would say that would be the difference from my reading of it. But um, you do want to build the structure and then layer it in, you know, and it does layer on top of the bone. So I, it's kind of cool that they're all kind of talking about that now as like a shared baseline. Forms and links and HTTP should be the, the foundation, the backbone of your application, you know. So I'll have to think more about that, though. I just have a, just listening to that, we'll wrap up for this question. Given that all web apps are going to have this foundation, this HTTP foundation, which we would say is like rock solid. Right. Is this going to allow web apps to like leapfrog mobile apps? <laughs> because we like, we're all building on this and we can finally look down at these mobile apps. <laughs> yeah. Good scoff question. Scoff at them. It's been a long time. You yeah. Know? They've been, I, they've been just shitting on us for I, years. They so. truly have. Yeah. Sadly, I really don't think so. But, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think apps like Trello and, and, and Gmail, even though like, I guess they're apps now, um, and people use the app version on the phone, I think people still like to sit down on their computer, and open up websites for those kinds of things. And like needless, like, I think it's, you'd have to, you're going to be in a minority if you're going to argue that like websites from 2005 that were just, you know, and again, back to just not to call them out, but I'm calling them out. Like this is how the web's worked since 2000, right? Webs uh, links and forms. The websites from 2005 are not going to be as delightful, easy to use, um, let you be as productive as like Trello does today. I mean, it's incredible what you can do on that. So anyways, to the native app thing, I, I think um, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, people try to make web apps and websites basically like shitty versions of native apps. And I think that's probably not, a good approach. I think it's better to like leverage the strengths of the platform. I mean, Facebook like started off as a website and it's the reach. The reach is always what the web has over yeah. the native platforms. It's always reach. So that's why you don't want to compete with iOS or native apps on their own terms because you're starting out with like literally two hands tied behind your back. You have to load the page fast. You don't get to have the user install a 50 megabyte app which is gonna obviously make it easier for the marginal interaction to be like extremely fast and performant because you're relying on 50 megabytes of code that's sitting there. So you don't wanna play their own game, right? That's why you want, that's why all these framework authors are so obsessed with like code splitting and small bundles because you want to play to your strengths and leverage the power of the web, which is the reach. So if you see a link for something, you want it to mm -hmm. pop open really quick. Um, you, you, it's a hard game that the web plays because you have to load things quickly, but then you, you want subsequent interactions to feel like an app. So I, yeah, I, I don't think that, I think they're just different. I think I'm always going to want to use my phone, a native app that's integrated, you know, um, to control my lights in my living room or whatever. I'm not going to want to open a website to do that necessarily. Yeah. I'm thinking more along the lines of that. If there's the mobile apps don't have this paradigm of, form submission and links right so they're back to yeah every time you turn on your lights on your phone yeah, yeah, they have like, to do prevent default right, well right. i guess there is no prevent default because the default would be hey developer do whatever you want right but, i would say i would say they get the benefit of like using coco or whatever the framework you know swift or whatever and that they get so they you know they have their they yeah, have fair, their tools fair, yep. and they are also all those apps are all like whatever they call cloud native app, right? It just means it works with the internet. So that you still have request response within like your fetch handler or whatever. Yeah. 
but it's way harder, dude. That's the thing. Like HTML is like dead easy, you know? And if you make a remix app, it's like so easy, especially because in remix, like you're, it's easier than rails because like your code is right there. You're looking at like one yeah. file. That's like literally an HTML form and like a three line function. That's right in the same file. You cannot get easier than that. It's way easier than yeah, making all- a new rails app. Which is which already is easier than making a new native app. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, giving the form and then the action that yeah. the server should run are yeah. just right next to each other. It's and that's incredible. all you care about. Yeah, yeah. You're literally like have abstracted away everything else. You know, yep. even the naming of things. So, like, you know, my controller method has to match whatever. Yep. Um, so yeah. Anyways. Cool. Yeah. Okay, we can wrap. Awesome. I'm gonna think more about the the live view stuff. I might even ask uh, Herman about that. But cool. That was a cool episode. We do want to talk about these React server components. Maybe we'll do that next week. But um, I think that's it for this week. Cool. So, yeah, if you're interested in the course, we have two episodes out now, two lessons on buildui.com. Um, so if you're interested in us and you like us and you want to support what we do on the Internet, check that out at buildui.com. You can always uh, leave a review for our podcast. Um uh, if you want to support the show, that's like a zero cost way to support the show. And we also publish video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. So you can check that out as well. Cool. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week, everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye.